development, but we also have some new developments on a story that broke at the end of our show yesterday. Years after Rudy Giuliani accused Georgia election workers, Ruby Freeman and Shea Moss, of fraud during the 2020 election, he is conceding his statements were false. This came in a court filing part of a defamation lawsuit Freeman and Moss filed against Giuliani in 2021. The case accuses Giuliani, who at the time, you'll remember, was representing former President Trump, of publicizing a heavily edited video he falsely alleged showed the two workers somehow changing votes. Tape earlier in the day of Ruby Freeman and Shea Freeman Moss and one other gentleman quite obviously surreptitiously passing around USB ports as if they are vials of heroin or cocaine. And they're still walking around Georgia lying. Should have been, they should have been, uh, should have been questioned already. Uh, their places of work, their homes should have been searched. In one of the videos we just watched, Mr. Giuliani accused you and your mother of passing some sort of USB drive to each other. Uh, what was your mom actually handing you on that video? A ginger mint. We had uh, at least 18,000 that's on tape. We had them counted very painstakingly. 18,000 voters uh, having to do with uh, Ruby Friedman. That's, uh, she's a vote scammer, a professional vote scammer and hustler. She was none of those things. Of course, in a two-page declaration, Giuliani now acknowledges he had, in fact, made the statements about Ms. Freeman and Ms. Moss that led to the filing of the suit and that the remarks, quote, carry meaning that is defamatory per se. A political advisor for Giuliani says that means, quote, Giuliani did not acknowledge that the statements were false, but did not contest it in order to move on to the portion of the case that will permit a motion to dismiss. Giuliani says he still believes his comments are protected by the First Amendment and refused to accept they cause harm to the women. Here is what Freeman and Moss told the January 6th committee last year about the harm they say they did endure. There is nowhere I feel safe. Nowhere. Do you know how it feels to have the president of the United States to target you? The president of the United States is supposed to represent every American, not to target one, but he targeted me, Lady Ruby, a small business owner, a mother, a proud American citizen who stand up to help Fulton County run an election in the middle of the pandemic. A lot of threats. Um, wishing death upon me, um, telling me that, you know, I'm, I'll be in jail with my mother and saying things like, be glad it's 2020 and not 1920. Were a lot of these threats and, and vile comments racist in nature? A lot of them were racist. A lot of them were just hateful. Attorneys for Freeman and Moss released a statement about the development saying, quote, Giuliani's stipulation concedes what we always have known to be true. The allegations of election fraud he and former President Trump made against them have been false since day one. So, Danny, let's talk about the legal implications of this. What is all that legalese that we heard from Giuliani and his team? What does that translate to? Well, it seems to me they're stipulating to the underlying facts because in order to get to the motion for summary judgment phase, there have to be no issues of fact. In other words, all the facts are, are conceded, and the only thing for the court to decide is an issue of law. And Giuliani's defense appears to be not so much that, hey, what I said about them was true or wasn't true. It's more that it doesn't matter what I said about them, whether it's true or not. I had a First Amendment right to say it. Therefore, there is no defamation. And that's why it appears that he's making this concession in order to put issues of fact aside, decide them for the moment, and get to the motion for summary judgment. And really, it's a, it's a minor kind of Hail Mary to try and throw the case out early. That's what summary judgment really is. It's always a long shot. The odds are, if you're moving for summary judgment, either as the plaintiff or the defendant, you're probably going to lose, and the case will probably move forward to trial. But it is a mechanism by which you can get Get rid of a case that has no issues of fact and only issues of law. If the only issues are of law, then the judge can decide them and everybody can move along. 
So, Eugene, uh, that's the legal aspect of this, but let's just speak about the, the morality of this moment. Right. This, was, this was reprehensible. This was something that was false. It was untrue. And as I noted in my book and others have chronicled so well, uh, and we heard that emotional testimony from these two election workers who were just trying to do the right thing, trying to, uh, frankly, do their civic duty. Yeah. And their, they felt like their lives were threatened. They were harassed for months. And it's in moments like this, repeated uh, other places across the country, have had a chilling effect where I know a lot of local officials are worried they're not going to be able to find poll workers and volunteers for the next election. People who have said and done it for years that they, they loved being a poll worker, that it felt like it gave them a lot of purpose around the elections, are terrified to do so because of these moments like this. And I will say, when we, for, when we saw these two women um, live when, during this committee hearing, that was one of the most emotional. It was one of the most interesting aspects of the committee hearing up to that point, um, because a lot of it was talking to officials and talking to you know Republicans who were in, the, in, in these rooms or seeing them as they were talking in their testimonies, this was about real people who had and who were impacted by the lies that that Giuliani and Donald Trump and others were telling. And I think that was one of the things that, as people were watching and you started seeing polling, that people were paying attention to those moments just as much as the fact-finding missions. And, and it's just a it's just a reminder of how central Rudy Giuliani and his lies during the during the 2020 the aftermath of the 2020 election and even before how central they are to a lot of the investigations swirling Donald Trump right now. The Federal Reserve yesterday increased interest rates by a quarter of a percentage point, signaling a wait-and-watch approach to any further rate hikes. Let's bring in former Treasury official and Morning Joe economic analyst resplendent in beige this morning, wearing his <laughs> summer suit and just crushing it right now. Steve Ratner is with us. Steve, good morning. Looking great, my friend. Well, if Barack Obama can do it at yes. his press conference, I can do it. And I can also moonlight as a good humor man if I need to. There you go. There you go. A jack of all trades. All right, so let's walk through some of these charts, Steve, starting with the expected height. We all knew that was coming a quarter of a percentage point. How significant was it? What do you read into the number? Sure, Willie. Well, let's uh, take a look here at this chart right over here, because just as a reminder, of course, we've had this incredible string of rising interest rates. And yesterday, the Fed rose uh, increased rates to around a five and a half percent rate. Now, both the Fed and the market think we are near the end of this cycle. They're looking at maybe one or two more interest rate increases before it starts to turn down, getting down here to about three and a half percent in about two and a half years. So we may, the end may be near here for our, heightening, for our tightening cycle. But I thought today we would take a look at what this means for average Americans. And so if you go back before COVID, of course, interest rates were in a kind of, fair, kind of fairly normal range. Homeowners paid for around 4%. Savers and money market funds got between 2 and 3%. Then, of course, it all went, rates went to zero. Mortgage rates came down. And now they're not, not surprisingly following the Fed up here. Here's the Fed. Here's what mortgage rates are. They've poked above 7%. Money market funds for the savers out there, close to 4%. Bank deposits still really haven't moved. They don't move that much. Banks need these low-cost deposits to create their profit margin. So you can see for both borrowers and savers, it's also been a pretty steep climb lately. And in your next chart, Steve, you point out the reason for this consistent uh, step up in rate hikes is because an economy, frankly, that has performed even better than the Fed expected it to. Yeah, exactly. Well, last month we added over 200,000 new jobs. The unemployment rate is close to a 50-year low at 3.6 percent. And, and economists have been bringing up their forecast for economic growth for this year now to 1.5 percent, not a huge amount. But back at the beginning of the year, people thought the economy was going to be almost at stall speed. So that is what has been driving the Fed up. But as we look ahead, we're not out of the woods yet in terms of the economy. Economists have been bringing down their projections for growth next year, really, to almost zero. And, in, and the probability of a recession, I know we're talking a lot lately about a soft landing. But if you ask economists, they still think there's a 60 percent or better chance of a recession uh, next year. So. We do. We are. We are at a kind of a crossroads in the economy at this moment. But Steve, it was significant, was it not, that the Fed said yesterday in announcing its rate hike that they've sort of taken the threat of recession way back from where they believed it was that they were not projecting a recession next year. Uh, that's exactly right, uh, Willie. Powell did pull back his recession forecast. I think we have a greater probability of a soft landing today than we, I would have said to you a few months ago. There's no question that in, uh, the economy is still remains strong and in 
inflation has been coming down perhaps a bit faster than we thought, but we're not out of the woods yet by any means. And in your last chart, Steve, you're looking at inflation, obviously key to all of this and what the Fed will be watching. Exactly. This is, uh, Powell made a point yesterday of saying the Fed, as, we, as they say often, is data dependent and what happens going forward will depend on a number of, of things that are really represented on these two charts. First, of course, is inflation. The CPI, which everybody focuses on, is the shaded area. And, of course, we all saw that 3% CPI number come out recently, and that was very encouraging. The Fed looks at a different measure of inflation called the PCE. I won't get into the weeds on that, but that's this dark line here. Uh, and this is headline. This includes food and energy, which, as we've talked about before, has driven a lot of the inflation during this past cycle. When you take food and energy out, which is what the, food, what the Fed and most economists do, uh, the, what we call core has not been as inflationary. But the PCE, again, is still sitting here at about 4.8 percent. We're going to get a new PCE number on Friday. The hope is for 4.2 percent. That would really be great. And that's one of the things the Fed's watching, to get down to this 2 percent level. It wants to be at 2 percent before it really starts cutting interest rates. The biggest driver of inflation is wages. We all want wages to go up. We want people to earn more, but that you have to find the happy balance between wage increases and wage increases that create inflation. And so, uh, again, wages were rising at a fairly normal rate. We all know that they jumped up. Interestingly, this light blue line is if you quit your job and take another job, you're going to get a bigger pay increase than if you stay in your job. But nonetheless, wage increases have started to moderate, but they're only down about 5.5%. We still have 1.6 unfilled jobs for every American who's looking for one. We still have almost 10 million unfilled jobs in this country, and that is uh, going to keep pressure on wages. And so the Fed needs this to come down to between 3 and 4 percent to have a hope of 2 percent inflation. So, Steve, maybe you can help us out with a perplexing question. There, I got it out. And the question would be the economy seems to be doing fairly well. It seems to be fairly helpful. Healthy unemployment is at historic lows, yada, yada, yada. Inflation has sort of been cured for a bit. Why is it that so many people are walking around in this country today saying it's terrible? Things are terrible for me. The, the, the future looks very bleak. What's, what's the contrast? Why? Uh, you know, Mike, it's a great question, and we've talked about it on this show before. I haven't had a perfect answer before. I'm probably not going to have a perfect answer now. I think there's a few things. I think there's still uh, – it takes a long time for people to get over uh, economic shocks of bad news, and we did go through a rough period, and I think people are still thinking about that. And secondly, I do think – and I think many people think inflation is what people really care about. When they see a lot of inflation – they assume it's bad for them. They assume that their after inflation incomes are going to go down. Their purchasing power is, go, is going to go down, and that bothers them. And then there's much longer-term, broader issues, the question of whether their kids are going to live as well as they do. All the polls say people think that's not going to happen, and that would be the first time in American history. So there's a lot of, there is a lot of history around this, and then there's also the need to get this inflation number down, I think, for people to really feel better. Fascinating stuff, as always. So, Tim, I want to talk about We the People Action Fund. It's a new group that, that you and some others have, have founded here. Yeah. And I love that what you say. You are the voice of the exhausted majority. Yeah. And boy, is that true. You t I feel it, too, when you go out there. They go, uh. <laughs> you know, it's just They're just exhausted by the last eight years. The daily churn of politics and the rhetoric and the hate that we're seeing spewed all over the place. They almost just want politicians to get out of their lives and yeah. get out of the way. Yeah. So what's the objective here with this group? Well, we want to be a home for the exhausted majority, and we want to try to elevate the conversation going on in the country. We're going to highlight the good stuff going on. There's so many people, ordinary people, doing extraordinary things around the country. There are innovative solutions around how we heal our vets with, with psilocybin, how we heal addiction with cannabinoids and, and cannabis, um, how we can actually have an energy policy in the United States that includes natural gas with renewables to displace coal. There's like real solutions out there to rebuild the middle class. It gets drowned out by the toxic conversation that we're having in the country. And so we, the people action fund, and people can go to uh, we, the people, um, 250, uh, dot us. And, and basically what we're trying to do is we're going to use the 250th anniversary of the country 
to say we want to usher in an era of responsibility, reform, civic engagement. It's not going to be outsourced to Washington, D.C. It's going to be done by average people doing extraordinary things, working together and getting past the toxic conversation we're having. So, Jim, speaking to that point about average people working together for the country, uh, last month, a section of uh, I-95 collapsed in the middle of Philadelphia. Yeah. And it was hysteria about how are people going to get around for the next several months. Twelve days, twelve days later, they had it repaired. It was a combination of another normal guy, the president of the United States, who's normal, like you, the governor, the governor of Pennsylvania. Low bar these days. <laughs> well, it is. It is. The governor of Pennsylvania, the, the Philadelphia mayor, 12 days they repaired I-95. How do you translate normalcy, competence, effectiveness to people like in Akron and Toledo that the job can be done, that we can still do what we used to do? I think hi highlighting examples like that, I think, you know, I mentioned the economic development happening, happening right outside of Columbus, Ohio, uh, auto plants, like things are happening because we took a stand, we passed the infrastructure bill, we passed the Inflation Reduction Act, we passed the CHIPS Act. Some, some, two of the three of those were bipartisan in nature, Republicans not screwing around trying to say, hey, we want to impeach the president, but saying, hey, we have to reshore chip manufacturing in the United States. It was stupid for us to let it go to Asia in the first place. Here's the policy in a bipartisan way that we can bring it back. And I think highlighting those things and campaigning on those things, because that's what the average person wants. Just go do your job. I get up every day. I go do my job. I bust my rear end and make ends meet for my family. If you're in government, go do your job, too. And that's what we want to highlight with, with the, the We the People Action Fund is to say, who's out there just slogging away, like trying to make a difference? There's a, there's a great group called MAPS. They're, they're, they've been doing research around healing vets for the last 25 or 30 years. They are healing vets with post-traumatic stress. Mm -hmm. They need resources. They need money. It's an innovative solution. And, and who's not for healing vets? Like we know natural gas and renewables together can displace coal and significantly bend the curve on carbon in the world. Let's get this stuff done. Let's, let's heal people. But underneath all that, there's great programs, school programs, um, that I've talked to Mika about, mindfulness-based trauma-informed care in our schools, healing kids with trauma. It's working. And I think that's why people are so frustrated. They see that little things here or there are working in the country, but yet the toxic conversation, the impeachment, Mark Meadows, all this BS that, that like we hear every single day. I want people to come to We The People Action Fund and help us celebrate those people. And we're gonna have compelling videos. Now, we will take on, and we will be hostile to the anti-democratic forces in the country because there is no growth, there is no innovation, there's no blossoming of these ideas if those forces are taking root. It's a virus in the country and we can't host that virus. Viruses need a host, we can't host it. And that's what we, the People Action Fund, is going to do. And I think the average person in Youngstown or Akron is going to—they're going to resonate with what we're doing. We're going to celebrate this country. We're going to usher in an era of reform and responsibility, new civ civic engagement, and hopefully create a new politics. It's a pretty good platform. We should run for something. Yeah. yeah. No, thank you. <laughs> Been there, done that. Claire, I'm sure whether you're at a Cardinals game in St. Louis or down at Lake of the Ooh. Ozarks, you're hearing from the exhausted majority too. Yeah, I think that phrase is really talking about resonate. Exhausted majority is right. Tim, I'm curious. Um, you know, there are a lot of groups out there right now, and some are taking some incoming, like no labels. And I think it has created a sense of distrust around people who could potentially donate to this effort. So can you be specific about what you're going to do with the money that you might raise in this, um, in this effort that you're undertaking? I think it's important for people to get an understanding. Is this just about messaging? Or are you actually going to fund political campaigns or fund some of these projects that you are lauding this morning? Yeah, this, this is going to be a uh, issue advocacy organization. So we want to advocate for some of the issues that I just mentioned. Uh, again, we do want to take on the, the hostile uh, anti-democratic forces in the 
uh, in the country, and we will be very, very firm uh, in our approach on, and how we do that. But w we really want to build out, uh, Claire, across the country an organization. You know, we, we saw, and you see this uh, too over the years, and Jen has seen it, we spend billions and billions of dollars on political campaigns volunteers, digital, all of that stuff. And then when the campaign's over, the, everything washes away like a sandcastle uh, on the beach that gets hit by a wave. We want a sustainable organization. We want a We the People representative in all 3,142 counties in the United States, we want to begin to stitch together in local communities with, with volunteerism and, and getting people engaged with what's going on in different communities across the country. So it's going to be an organization that both through compelling content, compelling videos, advocating for these, these ordinary people doing extraordinary things, these ideas that are out there that aren't getting any oxygen, we're going to give it oxygen. And then we're going to advocate for how we, we pass, support, and fund those kind of things we're gonna we've already been in contact with a lot of uh, artists and performers and musicians and bands we're going to do concerts across the country uh, over the coming years we really want this to be a big celebration like this country is going to be 250 years old I mean it's a minor miracle that we've made it this far and we want to say okay we want to do another 250 years we better get our act together and that's going to mean an era of responsibility increased civic engagement. So at all corners, we the people uh, is going to be pushing towards towards those efforts. We're not going to be a political party. Um, we're going to be an advocacy group. So you're happy coaching flag football. No chance to get back into politics. Yeah, no time soon. I'm enjoying it's just it's nice. Like, you know, I get to hang out with my family. I get to hang out with my kid. I'm like taking them to basketball camp. Like I took them to a Mark Price basketball camp like two weeks ago. Great Mark Price. Mark Price is the best, yeah. right? And I'm sitting there with Mark Price, who's now 60 years old. I'm now 50 years old, and like, you know, he's like coaching my kid. I'm like, it's not better than that. So I'm enjoying it, but I, I want to stay engaged. I mean, I spent my my whole adult life um, serving through Congress, and now I'm a private citizen. I want to, you know, continue that service. Still doing your part. The new political action committee is called We the People. If you want to get involved, the website is We the People 250. Dot us looking ahead to the 250th anniversary of the country congressman tim awesome. ryan of ohio great to be with so you guys again see you. come yeah. back soon thank you i'll wear a tie next time i promise <laughs> no you're, oh, you're, always, <laughs> you're always good here Still turn to russia in recent days that country has intensified attacks on ukraine's port cities the city of odessa has been struck by missiles or drones nearly every day since Russia left a key multi-nation grain deal last week. U.S. aid administrator Samantha Power is just back from a visit to Odessa and Kyiv, now announcing additional American funding to support Ukraine. And Administrator Power joins us now. Thank you so much for being with us. Uh, first of all, if you could tell us what you saw on the ground uh, here now, almost a year and a half into this war. How are the Ukrainian people holding up? Um, well, maybe I'll start in Odessa, um, that I arrived in the port city, um, first senior U.S. official to get down there, and um, the port, which had been buzzing with life uh, just a couple days before, was just dead, uh, insofar as Russia pulling out of the deal the day before I arrived meant that none of the ships, none of the workers, none of the economic life that is so central to Odessa's economic survival alongside its physical survival, uh, all of that uh, had gone quiet. So that, that was um, something that, of course, everybody was lamenting. They had expected it. Uh, Russia wants to destroy Ukraine's economy as a way of uh, forcing it uh, to surrender, uh, since it's not going very well for Russia on the battlefield itself. Um, I'd say writ large, you know, they, they're digging in for a long, a long winter ahead. I think there had been hope uh, that the war would end sooner, but now they're thinking about how do we uh, protect our energy infrastructure, because now we know going into the winter that Putin's going to weaponize the cold as he weaponizes food. So there's really just a pragmatic mindset. Um, I wouldn't say morale is thrilled that the war is, you know, dragging in uh, halfway through its second year. Um, but you sense uh, no diminishment of support for President Zelensky and such a, uh, a dedication to the so-called patriots or heroes who are going and fighting this really tough counteroffensive, which, of course, is grueling because of the Russian defenses that have been set up, including minefields, booby traps and the like.
So, Samantha, to that point that you just raised, we showed a clip of you meeting with President Zelensky just a couple of seconds ago. You've been to Odessa, you've met with the Ukrainian people, you've met with many veterans of the Ukrainian war, people who are still fighting the war each day. Uh, President Zelensky came under some controversy a couple of weeks ago, implying that he wasn't grateful enough to the United States and to NATO for the equipment and uh, ordnance that he's been that have been shipped uh, into Ukraine. But what if we take a pause here and think about the fact that perhaps it is us, the United States and the free NATO countries, who ought to thank the Ukrainian people for what they're doing, fighting, fighting Russia? Yeah, I mean, I have to tell you, every meeting you have when you're over there is the first five minutes is this effusive thanks for, in the case of USAID, we have the privilege of providing direct budget support, which keeps the government going, allows teachers, healthcare workers, firefighters who are very needed, of course, in a war, uh, allows them to continue to be paid, allows pensioners not to go cold in winter. And so they thank you. And you just you f it feels super awkward. It's a what? No, no. Thank you. Uh, thank mm. you, President Zelensky. Thank you, uh, mental health care workers, those who are counseling people who've suffered gender based violence. Thank you who are documenting war crimes uh, to try to bring the perpetrators uh, to justice ultimately. So I very much feel the same way you do. And uh, I can just assure you that in, in my meetings, there was no shortage of gratitude. There's also always a list uh, because this war is not easy and Russia is bringing everything at uh, the Ukrainian people, not just on the military battlefield, but, you know, by attacking civilians, you know, Zelensky's very eager to do everything he can to protect civilian infrastructure, to, to uh, protect civilian population centers like Odessa, which is now a target really for the first time uh, in more than a year. Uh, so we talked about that. But the other thing I would say is Zelensky's very focused on resuscitating the Ukrainian economy. So apart from security asks, his number one non-security ask was support for small and medium-sized enterprises, which I think might surprise uh, an American audience. But, you know, he wants business to boom, and the tech sector has grown 6 or 7 percent over the course of the last year, or actually since the war started. So that's something USAID is looking at, is how do we attract Ukrainian refugees back from Europe, uh, which mainly female refugees, women refugees, as the men stay on the, on the front. Uh, and part of doing that is supporting agriculture, supporting SMEs, um, and, and really uh, backing the entrepreneurship that we see on the battlefield, but that actually they're bringing as well uh, to, to business and to the private sector. Minister of Power, Jonathan Lemire, I wanted to go a little further with what you just brought up there. Obviously, the focus is on the, the military fight, the military funding. Ukraine's counteroffensive has really ramped up in recent days. But of course, there's also the need to rebuild the country, an effort that can't wait uh, until the fighting stops. Could you just put into perspective for those watching today just the sheer enormity of the reconstruction project that lies ahead for such a war battered nation? Well, I mean, the estimates go up every day, right, of the wartime damage that Putin has uh, inflicted. We, USAID, uh, on, you know, in support of the Ukrainians, we operate in the here and now and think about the, the long-term reconstruction in the here and now every time Putin hits a grain silo. Uh, the Ukrainians want to patch it up and make sure that it's ready for the next uh, harvested crop to come and, and, and store that crop. So you might have seen earlier in the week that uh, grain infrastructure was hit not only in Odessa, but actually for the first time in the Danube River ports, which USAID has helped um, uh, expand the use of so that uh, the Ukrainians are not only reliant on the Black Sea and, of course, as Putin, knowing that they're using these ports more and more, hit those. Well, it looked like that was going to be very damaging. Uh, but within 24 hours, those ports were up and running as if nothing had happened. So I want to stress that reconstruction is happening now. USAID invested $400 million in the winter on energy infrastructure repair. Uh, but we just met uh, in London. Secretary Blinken uh, attended for the United States with the donors who are already thinking about what the scale of that mammoth enterprise uh, when the war is, is concluded. But again, we're trying to attract the private sector now. There are large parts of the country that are peaceful and there is there are business sectors that are growing or that we just need to sustain like the agricultural sector so we have to do repairs in the moment and then uh, bring in the multilateral development banks the private sector and other donors in the long term for that that much much more substantial enterprise
All important work. USAID Administrator Samantha Power, thank you so much for being here this morning. We appreciate it. Claire, uh, before we let you go today, we're told here at NBC News that Donald Trump's legal team is preparing for the possibility of an indictment coming down today. What a federal grand jury is expected to meet could happen today. We don't know for sure. Um, as a former prosecutor, what are you looking for? Any telltale signs here? What may happen today? Well, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. I think for both Fannie Willis in Georgia and for Jack Smith in terms of a federal indictment, uh, what I'm going to be really interested in is who appears on the witness list for the government, who has been given immunity, uh, who has been told, we will not prosecute you, but you've got to tell us honestly everything that happened. You can't hide behind the Fifth Amendment. Um, the question is, for everyone who's working for Donald Trump right now, have you requested and received a rider on your employment contract that you get a million dollars a year for legal fees? Because if you add up the amount of money that people who foolishly went to work for this guy are spending on trying to keep themselves out of jail, it's a huge number. And Mark Meadows is, is, is one that has been mentioned earlier on the program. I think that is somebody who is in the room and listen to Donald Trump during those hours where he was doing nothing, when police officers were being attacked and people were being shot. He is the one that was in the room when they tried to get the votes out of Georgia fraudulently to deny the people of America a fair and free election. So it is one of those things that I think the witnesses and who's been given immunity is going to tell the tale over how much difficulty Donald Trump is actually going to have. And there was damning testimony. Our viewers remember last summer during the January 6th Select Committee hearings about how the chief of staff, Mark Meadows, performed that day on January 6th and sat back and let it happen. So we'll see if he's involved in all of this. Claire McCaskill, thank you so much. We'll see you very soon, I know. Come Despite expressing uh, optimism about the chances of avoiding recession, as I said, Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell did temper expectations yesterday about the housing market cooling down anytime soon. I think we've got a ways to go to get back to balance with existing homes. Uh, you know, there are many people who have low rate mortgages and whereas they might want to sell in a normal uh, situation, they're not going to because they have such so much value in their mortgage, which means that supply of existing homes is really, really tight, which is keeping prices up. Later this morning, the White House will announce a new program that aims to lower housing costs and boost supply. For more, let's bring in U.S. Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, Marsha Fudge. Secretary Fudge, it's so great to have you with us here in New Thank York. You. So tell us more about this program and how it aims to make housing, which has gotten very expensive, as you know, affordable for more people in this country. Thank you so much for having me, Willie. And let me just say that everybody in the country knows we have a crisis of affordable housing. But the only way to get costs down is to assist developers and builders in building more homes. If we don't put more supply on the market, the prices are not going to go down. So what we are announcing today is that there's going to be um, a notice of funding for $85 million for communities to apply to say, help us find ways to deal with our zoning and our restrictions so that we can streamline the process. Uh, just on yesterday, I was in Birmingham, Alabama, one of eight cities where we are giving out $50 million grants to assist them in rehabilitating and reviving neighborhoods. So in Birmingham alone, it's going to put a thousand new homes on the market. Mm -hmm. uh, we are looking at ways to reduce interest rates for builders. We have resources to maintain and preserve the housing we have. And so today, the White House is going to really show people that Bidenomics really does work. By us infusing resources into our communities, we are finding ways to build more housing. Willie, we are one and a half million housing units short in this country today. The only way to get the cost down is to build more housing. So what is the impact, Secretary Fudge, of the housing shortage? In other words, if you have a community like Birmingham that just doesn't have enough housing for the people who need it, how does that impact a city, which is what you're trying to remedy here? Without the housing, you find a number of things. One is young people are not buying homes. Young people can't even rent anymore, so they're staying at home with their parents. Uh, you have more people who are rent burdened, who are spending as much as 50% of their income on rent or mortgages. Uh, we're not doing as many mortgages because people can't afford to buy homes. It is also pushing some people to the street. 
you are going to see that our homelessness numbers are going up mm -hmm. because people can't afford to live in major cities like this one or Los Angeles or San Francisco, Washington, D.C. It is a major problem, and it is creating for people the inability to do anything else because they're spending all their money on rent. Secretary Fudge, Jonathan Lemire is in Washington with a question for you. John? Good morning, Secretary. I just I wanted to actually return to the uh, topic of homelessness. As you just said, it's not just a more visible problem. The numbers back it up, and it's on the rise in many, many major cities across this country. So can you walk us through some of the plans that you that, that, that HUD has to try to deal with, it, with homelessness, to try to provide shelter for these people? The president in, in the American Rescue Plan put $10 billion into addressing homelessness. Then there's an additional, we put in vouchers back on the street. We are talking with communities every day about how we can assist. But when you start to talk about the numbers, the sheer numbers, uh, in the greatest nation in the world to have 500,000 people sleeping on the streets is a lot. So we are putting resources to unsheltered homelessness. Tens of billions of dollars are going into these resources. And we have made it a government-wide crisis so that every single agency that can help is helping, whether it be EPA, they're putting out money right now to start to talk about how we green and retrofit some, some places. We're talking about transportation that is pulling communities back together and helping us with transit-oriented uh, building. We are talking about um, the, the HHS with services. So we are working across across every single agency to address the problem because it is a major problem. People don't like to talk about it, but it is a major problem. Think about senior citizens who are on fixed incomes. We don't have enough senior housing in this country. Uh, and the housing we do have, people can't age in place because of the way that it was built. We need to get communities to build more homes in more dense communities, but it's a difficult I mean, it's a difficult situation. That's why we're putting out this $85 million notice of funding today to say to them, you can make building homes for seniors better. You can make building homes for families better because families and children are living on the streets. Local governments, states, all kinds of groups can apply for this funding. It's called right. the Pathways to Removing Obstacles to Housing, or PRO. Housing will be announced today. That's right. Thank you for being here to walk yeah. us through it. We appreciate it. Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, Marsha Fudge, thanks for your time today. Thank you so nice much. Nice to see you. Britney is on Broadway. Some of the pop star's best known hits provide the soundtrack to the new musical, Once Upon a One More Time. And joining us now are the stars of the show, Briga Helan, who plays Cinderella, and Justin Guarini, who plays Prince Charming. Hey guys, great to see you. Hi, Good morning. thank you for having us. We're so happy you're here. Congratulations on the show. Thank you. People are loving it, getting great reviews. Yeah. They love to hear the music. Mm -hmm. So tell us how this came to you and what you thought at first when you heard about a musical with Britney Spears music. I was in disbelief. I was like, is this a, is this a joke? Because it's all of my dreams put into one thing. <laughs> so I thought I was being pranked for a long time. Mm -hmm. Turns out I'm not. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was the first time I read the script. I thought I thought it was so beautiful and so exciting. Um, it was just something that I felt like I had to do with the yeah. second get Cinderella and Britney in one package. Yeah, what and it's hilarious. Yeah. Right, so tell us about your version, Justin, of Prince Charming. Well, what's interesting about Prince Charming is that we've always seen him as this one thing, right? And what I love about the Prince Charming that I get to play and that we have is that he gets to go on the journey from understanding that, wait, maybe the, this thing that I've been considering charming isn't really the most charming <laughs> thing in the yeah. world. And maybe it was, you know, 500 years ago when the story was written. But now, you know, times have changed and, and women have changed and the world has changed. And it's about his journey of going on that. And being a person of color, it's really awesome for me to be able to represent Prince Charming in that way. So, Briga, we don't want to give away too much. We want people to go see and enjoy and enjoy all the, the twists. But a little bit about this version of the Cinderella Prince Charming story, if, to the extent you can 
say. Uh, Don't mess it up. Sure. Ooh, Don't mess it up. It's a lot of pressure. <laughs> I feel like this pressure should be on you right now, but it's on me. You can sure. um, take it together. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, yes, well, Prince Charming and Cinderella start out in the in the conventional way that you sort of always know them, and then mm -hmm. you realize that his uh, world may be a bit broader. <laughs> there you go. Nice ways. dodge. That was well handled. How about for you, Justin? Yeah, for sure. Well, it's just the journey of understanding that in this story that has been the story that everybody knows for so long that these characters and also the people watching it have the ability to write their own stories. Mm -hmm. And so we love that. And so we get to wrap all that up in this absolutely fun, amazing party atmosphere. So many people come to the show saying, I didn't know what to expect, yeah. but I had no idea it would be this. Yes. And it's just a party. It's fun. And I think it's what we need at a time like this. Yeah. And this show, Briga, has Britney's blessing. She's a producer on it. I understand she came to see the show. She's seen and, yeah, iterations she came of to the see show. Workshop, yeah. And what yeah. is it like to look out in the audience and see Britney Spears sitting there? Well, I haven't personally gotten to have that experience. Okay. She came before okay. I was on okay. board. I okay. was very, I was sort of on the last um, one Got of the it. people that were cast. But uh, I mean, I dream about that certainly well, and just to know that we're working on yeah. it i got to do the workshop where she did come to see it and she was excited she and like audiences and like us when we read the script she was so excited we are so excited to see how her songs get woven is that a word yeah. Woven? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yes no, yeah. into weaved did yeah. weaved did <laughs> into <laughs> the script That's better the first thing. time but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, woven into the script and so you know john hartmere our writer has done a brilliant job of taking this fairy tale world and her songs and putting them together in this really fun heartfelt way i have to say as someone who grew up in the new york area and was taken to broadway shows from the time i was a kid it's so nice to see it coming back to see the yes. theaters filled to feel that energy what's it been like for you so far it's so exciting it's such a beautiful moment to get yeah. to be doing this show and yeah. and the crowds that this show appeals to is so exciting we've got young young kids there mm. who are seeing their first broadway show mm. it's our show and they don't even know the Britney right. music right. Yeah. and they're moved and touched and so excited and then you've got Britney's hardcore fans, which is like <laughs> myself and my peers who are there going, I wish that I saw, I wish I had this when I were younger. I wish yeah. I had this version of these fairy tales when I was younger. You know? How much fun is it to stand on that stage, Justin? You know, it's so much fun. And then getting to, to watch it back, you know, one of the things I've always said during rehearsals, I'm like, I wish we could somehow actually project and see ourselves doing this show. But as you can see right here, I mean, it is like a concert experience. Getting to be on that stage, I've gotten, I've uh, been fortunate to tour around the country uh, and singing. And, and this is the closest that I've ever been on Broadway to having that same sort of like summer concert wow. experience on stage. That's really cool. And a big sing-along dance dance along yeah. for the audience. Oh, yeah. A lot of fun in that theater. It's called Once Upon a One More Time. It's playing on Broadway at the Marquee Theater. Briga Heal and Justin Guarini, congratulations. Hey, and great to see you both. Great to see you. Thanks for being here.